Today we carry on the theme of inaction to see what ways of thinking it opens up as we consider the move from a sort of a focus on an individual, individual body, individual system, individual person or organism, to interactions and the manner in which um, we become entangled with each other. Um, the readings for this week crucially involve the very important paper that introduced the notion of participatory sense-making by Hannah de Jager and Ezekiel de Paolo. There's a second article by Tom Foruza that gives you some sense of the vista that opens up as we change our way of thinking here a little bit and how inactive ideas might lead us to um, creative ways of tackling uh, problems that otherwise uh, we lack firm foundations for. So the last day we introduced a whole bunch of really important concepts. Most of them start with the autonomy of the individual system under consideration, whether it be a single cell or a person or a generic system. Um, autonomy is crucial. We, we met this with the notion of organizational closure in which a, the processes that make up the system under consideration have a certain uh, coherence to them, circularity in their organization so that the identity of the system is produced through the regulated exchange with its environment, for lack of a better word. And that process of active persistence, if you will, is called sense-making. Allied to that, we have the very important notions of structural coupling, which allow consideration of changes, linked mutual changes, in the constitution of both organism and environment over time, allowing us to think differently about historical trajectories, whether they be of short term or as long as evolutionary time. And we saw that this way of thinking is um, quite foreign to a metaphysics of subjects and objects. And with that, it maybe lays claim to refashioning uh, how we think of naturalistic explanation. So today's move is from that basic picture of sense-making to participatory sense-making. And I think the graphics that are in conventional use here are very useful because you can, well, I could speak volumes on participatory sense-making, but I think you can see it <laughs> in this formalism in which the sense-making of two or more systems become entangled. Now, we're still being, we're developing an abstract idea here for now. So what these systems are will be articulated differently as we consider different examples. But that the sense-making activities of, for example, conspecifics should be important to one's own constitution, I think goes without saying. <laughs> the strongly individualistic focus of psychological theory, in the, especially in the within the cognitivist realm makes it difficult or doesn't impose that importance of others and of interaction. And that becomes the central theme now of participatory sense-making. When Ezekiel is talking about this in public, he often uses the following example, which is a little stilted, I must admit, but it illustrates this becoming entangled such that the entanglement or the interaction itself acquires its own temporary autonomy. Um, the example is taken from North by Northwest, and it's fun. Oh. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. My fault. That's not how the actual dance happens, but we have all found ourselves in the dance of an interaction with someone else where we each wanted to perhaps go our separate ways and yet the interaction itself takes over. You know how hard it is to leave a conversation. 
for example, if you're on the phone, getting off the phone sometimes requires a um, quite a long dance. So it is possible to enter into interactions in which the interaction itself exerts a norm on the participants in the interaction. And in this way, we become entangled. So as we move from this clear distinction between subjects and objects, <coughs> And into more consideration of the manner in which we engage in reciprocal relationships, um, these entanglements are going to get very important and somewhat confusing. Just to note that when we think of things, it's much easier to think of one thing at a time. And in a simple discourse, everyday discourse, in which subjects and objects are clearly separate, we can think of a thing like a teapot without any problem. There's the teapot. One thing. We can also think of two things. We're pretty good at thinking of two things, as shown here by the seesaw. We can bear two things in mind as we consider causes and effects, for example, or correlated processes or functions, inputs and outputs. Considering two things at a time is usually, it's our strength. We're pretty good at that. Considering three or more things at a time seems to be impossibly difficult. This arises already in mechanics, where cause and effect are illustrated by the, the, the mm. interaction of one billiard ball with another. But if we complicate the picture and have three balls, that problem becomes already intractable in terms of simple causes and effects. And this is the challenge we're going to face now as we consider interactions among the living. Now, in the strongly individualist and cognitivist framings that are dominant in our society, the question of how we regard, understand, and interact with other people is always done from something of a spectatorial point of view, in which other people appear as puzzles for us to figure out. And in the participatory sense-making paper, you find the two conventional approaches within cognitive psychology here, which go by the name of theory theory and simulation theory. In theory theory, it's hypothesized that we figure other people out because we figure the world out by making hypotheses about it um, and developing, as it were, an internal representation of how things are. Uh, other people are then just more puzzles in the world. And this kind of approach is well illustrated by the familiar um, task a uh, false belief task, a uh, uh, test I believe you're, you're familiar with, which is often done on infants to demonstrate when they've passed one of these Piagetian landmarks in reasoning about other people. Infants, well, young children, pass that threshold and then they seem to reason as if they had decided or recognized that other people harbor beliefs. Now, what a belief is, I don't know. There's a lot of abstraction going on here, but it's one person figuring another person out. And a competitor, and to my mind, not a strong competitor, but you make your own choices here. Another variant on this is simulation theory, which was briefly in vogue in the 1980s as computationalism um, was the only game in town. And this suggests that we simulate what it is like to be another person. And I can make no more sense of that than this stupid graphic, to be honest with you. But this kind of thinking got a boost, as you know, with the mirror neuron fad, which is thankfully now abating. Whether that's a plausible hypothesis or way of thinking is up to you to decide. But both of these have come in for strong criticism. Both of them miss the body entirely, so cognition here is... Um, totally abstract intellectual and social interaction then becomes a form of disembodied message passing. Um, when two bodies do interact, and we're using the handshake to stay safe, stay child-friendly here, um, reciprocity is necessarily involved in any bodily interaction, and that's completely missing from such abstract takes. Um, I mentioned that theory, theory leans on stages of development through Piaget, but we've met before in the Introduction to Cognitive Science course, we've met the counterpart that needs to be considered, which is provided helpfully by Vygotsky, in which we come into being through social interaction and are never independent of this mutuality and reciprocity. 
There's a third way to be less than enthusiastic about such stories, and that is that this is not what social interaction feels like. Um, the, you know, the Hitchcock film Rear Window features Jimmy Cagney. I just, is it Jimmy Cagney? Doesn't matter. Um, sorry, James Stewart, who is observing someone from, he's in a wheelchair because he broke his leg and he's looking out over a courtyard and he observes goings on in the buildings across the way, including murders and all kinds of things. It's very dramatic. But crucially, he can't intervene. He's not part of them. He's a detached spectator who can, is incapable of being part of the situation which he's observing. And I think this this satisfaction might be heightened to us all uh, after the recent pandemic, where we've learned to recognize and appreciate the value of embodied person-to-person -person interaction, which is not merely face-to-face, -face, that's Zoom is face-to-face, -face, but in-person interaction is whole body to whole body, and we've all become rather aware of how important that is. So the technical language introduced for discussing a single system and its sense-making activities extends naturally to this case of mutual interaction, to participatory sense-making. <clears throat> the autopoetic system that sustains itself through regulated exchange with its environment is never isolated from its environment. It's never a spectator. Its milieu or environment, and I unfortunately don't have a better word for it, they are inseparable in principle. And since the sense-making is based on this, well, in some accounts, a sensory modal loop, um, and is mediated through the environment, then the sense-making activities of other systems around you, other uh, systems that are in physical proximity, um, will become non-independent. There will be an interaction, it's a logical necessity that there will be interactions between the sense-making of distinct individuals so that they get drawn into each other's um, activity or cognition even. So if system B is part of the environment of system A, then these systems become entangled in a way that we need to make sense of. They will also become partially congruent that is, they will come to partially inhabit a shared world. Now, you'll have to think this through carefully for yourself and recognize the importance here also of the notion of uh, structural coupling, which extends where, where we think about extended processes over time and how the system and its world co-develop in that time. This way of framing things gives us potentially new ways of latching on to old problems in for example, language, which is a very, very important part of how we come to occupy shared worlds, of technology, which hopefully affects you in the same way that it affects me, so as technological innovations, everything from the first flint axe to the computer I'm using here in front of me, becomes part of our world, part of our sense-making activities, so the technology also becomes part of the sharing of the world that we occupy. And as difficult as it is, this seems to me to be a useful way of tackling the challenge of ecological thinking. Now in ecological thinking, we can't think about one thing or two things, and three things is not enough. We have to think about a whole, an infinite number of things which engage in delicate reciprocal dance. That we are non-independent in our embodied interactions is fairly clear. But let me just visually demonstrate it. Here are four clips from a situation we set up a few years ago where we recorded a bunch of us having a conversation. You're seeing here two people in a five-party conversation. You can't actually see any of the people who are speaking, but you can clearly observe that these two people who are part of this larger five-person conversation, that their actions are non-independent. Here the heads turn at the same time. Here again the heads turn at the same time as the conversation develops. Here there's a similar emotional reaction to a point. There's smiles that appear at the same time. And there's nods that appear. And here you can, might, might even notice that the nodding of the heads 
are relatively synchronous. And I'm not cherry picking here. Here's four more. One, two, three, four. Just to show you how absolutely involved we become with our whole bodies in a conversation, even if we're just listening. So this serves to, I hope, prime the way that you might think about interactions. Here's an, a funny example. Again, a little bit lighthearted, but here's two rats. I'm just going to leave these cool rats here for one minute. Bear with me. And ask yourself to what extent these rats, who have a peculiar form of social interactions, to what extent it would make sense to consider one of them independently of the other. are too much fun they go on for three minutes like that they're clearly they are completely entangled it doesn't make sense to think of either of them as an independent actor while they are caught in this interaction this is a good a way to show you that the thought process induced by watching the staged interaction in the train corridor finds more realistic implementations as well here are two examples from experimental work that I did where I had people in the laboratory repeating sentences that I made up in synchrony with each other. And what I want you to see is that under these artificial conditions of speaking in synchrony, the two people become completely non-independent of each other so that it wouldn't even make sense to say that I'm controlling my speech and you are controlling your speech. See if you can hear where a single organized domain falls apart into two separate domains when one person makes a speech error. The phrase they're reciting is big dinosaurs and bigger Daleks in battle. Ask me another time why. Big dinosaurs and bigger Daleks in battle. 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 And to show you again that this is no fluke, here's a second example where they're reciting word lists. Shady, Shady, final, patter, folly, bingo, but... <laughs> Sorry again. But one of them makes a slight mistake, and that's enough to cause the whole two-person coordination to disintegrate. This is a speech error which never occurs outside of this kind of synchronized speaking condition. We do not just abruptly break off in the middle of a syllable like that, and we certainly don't do it simultaneously. It's the task that creates this strong entanglement, which has a reality and a normative influence of its own. Such concerns can be found in the literature long before an act of theory comes out. So in the introduction class, we would have met this old study from Murray and Trevartan, which set up an elaborate, basically a Skype call or a Zoom chat between an infant and its mother, and had the child interact with its mother basically over Zoom and found that the children were happy. But later on in the afternoon, they played the child a recording of the mother from the earlier session and the children just aren't fooled for a minute. The children have this sensitivity to social interaction. They are will never mistake a recording for, the, um, for that which a live interaction offers. Another example from a very different domain Scott Kelso did some wonderful work studying the coordination of horses and their riders, in which they stuck point light markers on riders and horses for both novice riders and for expert riders. And they tracked the movements of various parts of the body of the rider and the horse simultaneously. Now, of course, the horse is moving and so the rider is moving. But what was distinguished, and we don't have real time to do justice to these beautiful data, what was found was that the novice rider is relatively independent of the horse and that there's a, a great deal of variability in the temporal relation between the novice and the horse. This is most clearly seen here where we've got the phase relationship between markers on the rider 
at the top half of the two top graphs and of the horse at the bottom. And what um, the expert is on the right and the novice is on the left. And what you can see is that the phase relations of the expert's body are clustered and very lack a great deal of variability, whereas the novice is much more fluid and dis distributed, much more independent of the horse. The expert and the, the expert rider and the horse have become one, as it were, and we can document and see this, whereas the novice and the rider are still struggling somewhat with each other. Now, we could go on and do more and more examples. I think the visual examples are helpful. The texts will prompt your thought um, through the magic medium of words. But what we're talking about is a way of educating our vision so that we come at problems of participation, mutuality, reciprocity, and interaction with new tools in our armory. Um, so I look forward to discussing that one in class.